And welcome inside the Backstage Pass here for a Friday, August the 5th. Hard to believe it's the first week of August. Felt like we just started that just a few days ago, which we did. But now we're kind of into it now. And before you know it, you'll look up here in a couple of weeks and we'll be saying August 15th, which is uh, my brother's birthday. And of course, my wife's birthday was yesterday. So definitely birthdays keep going. Shows keep moving on. And we're getting into the hopefully the cooler parts of uh the weather here in Texas, a little bit of rain, cooling things off and getting ready for football season coming up here in about three weeks. Uh, countdown to kickoff, August 26th. Viter at uh, Silsby down here at CajunCountryRadio.com. You can hear the call. Yours truly, Robbie Lynn Steptoe, and my good friend Kevin Bercato, who makes us sound good and keeps us on the air. We're live right now on the YouTube channel and at the SportsGuysPodcast.com. It is the Backstage Pass. And I tell you what, anytime I have a chance to interview an icon of the business and a hell of a songwriter, I'm going to bring her back on here on the program. We got to meet her in Nashville at CRS 2022. Uh, she's one of the all-time greats. Uh, Deborah Allen joins us back here on the show. Miss Deborah, how are things going? Going great, Brandon. It's so good to be here. Thanks for having me on your show. <laughs> we appreciate you, no doubt, and always good to be back. And we had a good conversation up there in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, about this great album you got out now called The Art of Dreaming. It's doing very well uh, for you and, of course, all the fans. But, hey, take me back a little bit. I know that the key to long-term in anything you try to do is – the key to success is just keep grinding, keep doing it too as well. And we've asked that question, you know, many times to new artists, some of the challenges they face. But you've been doing this a long time. And anybody that knows you or maybe does not know, your story was very special. A very special story that brought you to Nashville, Tennessee, allowed you to work with some of the greatest songwriters in the history to, to, to pin a lot of the songs that you've recorded. Remind those folks just that journey a little bit on what it was like to start back in the, the late seventies to early eighties to find success and then to work with some of the best, uh, the best names in the business. Well, you know, I was born and raised in Memphis and, um, you know, Elvis was always in our midst and, uh, I was even uh, chosen to be one of George Klein's WHB cuties. And, uh, I don't <laughs> know if you're familiar with George, if mm -hmm. not, you know, do you know who George is? I do. George? Yeah. Yeah. He was one of Elvis's best friends and he had a TV show uh, every Saturday and he was, played a pretty eclectic mix of music in Memphis. And I was uh, one of the the hostess host on the show, but uh, I'd got the itch to move to Nashville. And so I sat down with George and he said, I think you ought to go, you know? So I did. And, you know, I really didn't have uh, an exact plan, except mm -hmm. that I knew that I was practically born singing and that that's what I wanted to do. So I naturally gravitated to people like that. And, but, you know, along with gravitating to your, you know, people that are doing what you would like to be doing, you also have to make a living at the same time. Mm -hmm. So for a short time, I worked at uh, the IHOP right mm -hmm. at the top of Music Row. And I didn't know it, but it was where I learned uh, that it was where a lot of producers, songwriters, recording artists would go there and uh, gravitated there and hung out you know, all through the day, all through the night. And I didn't work there very long because to be honest with you, I wasn't much of a waitress, but <laughs> I learned a lot there. And, uh, but I, I made a lot of friends there so I could return to the IHOP in the mornings or whenever and have a bite to eat and not feel like the lonely girl. One morning mm -hmm. I was there and I glanced across the, uh, the dining room and I saw this guy and there was jet black hair and another guy with kind of salt and pepper hair. And I thought, I know those guys are in the music business. And I was about 18 years old. Mm -hmm. So I was sitting there and I was going, I got to talk to those guys. So don't ask me why I did this, Brandon. But I got up, I went over to the edge of their booth and I stand there and I go, <clears throat> excuse me, but um, are y'all in the insurance business? And they go, no, darling. We're in the music business. I slide into that booth and I say, that's what I was thinking. Listen, I'm I'm a singer and I'm trying to get started. And I, I swear, if, a, if it had been me or anyone else, it, they might have said, wait a minute, my pancakes are getting cold here. We'll have to talk later. But they didn't. They were so kind to me. And, and you know, I really thought I would never see them to, again. I thought they were just being sweet to someone with a dream. But two weeks later, I walked down to AFTRA. Uh, mm -hmm. American Federation Television and Radio Artists. And um, I walked in and they said, oh, we're so glad to see you. And I said, why? They said, someone's looking for you. And I said, who? Oh, and I forgot to tell you who that was. It was Roy Orbison, <laughs> Joe Nelson. So uh, there I was sitting with uh, country music and rock and roll royalty right there at the IHOP. 
And uh, anyway, they reached out to me to come and sing on a couple of tracks of Roy's. They weren't mm -hmm. his big famous tracks, but, you know, they were just giving me an opportunity to have a little bit of studio time. And I made a little money and that lifted my spirits. And uh, it it's kind of set me in the right direction. And, and then the next the next thing that happened to me after that was I was hanging out a lot at Waylon Jennings office because one of my dear friends, Marie Barrett, Mm -hmm. yeah. Marie Barrett uh, wound up marrying John Hartford, who used to hang out at Wayland's all the time. Anyway, I was hanging out there, and that's where I came in contact with Shel Silverstein. Mm -hmm. And yeah. by then, I was singing at a, at a little happy hour gig, just trying to get out and make some money and be heard. And I said, hey, would you come hear me sing? And he was like, yeah, I'll come hear you sing. So he showed up. I mean, he looks like a pirate. His head's shaved and he's got a beard. And, uh, you know, I knew that he was amazing because he was a poet and a songwriter. He had written some incredible songs like on a cover of a Rolling Stone, uh, A Boy mm -hmm. Named Sue, Big Brass Bread for Brenda Lee. I mean, on the list goes on and on. Anyway, he showed up. And after my set, I, I go and sit with him and I go, so what'd you think? And he said, well, I think you got a great voice. And I'm like, oh boy, I'm getting ready to be discovered. But then he went on to say, you know how good you feel when you're up there on that stage? And I'm like, what is he getting at? And I go, yeah. He goes, that feeling goes away, doesn't it? And I'm like, still puzzled. I'm thinking, yeah. And he said, you know, I, have you ever thought about writing songs? And I said, mm -hmm. uh, no, I mean, I've written some poems. I've never written a song. He goes, I think y'all think about writing songs. He goes, because, you know, with a song, you can create your own style. And he said, you know, it's something that you can keep with you forever. And he goes, you know, the sun doesn't shine on the same dog's back every day. <laughs> and, you know, and really, as time went on, I realized what he was telling me is you can't have a number one song on the charts every day. Mm -hmm. But. Yep. And, oh, and the other thing he threw in, he goes, besides, it'll keep you from going crazy. <laughs> I can't really attest to that totally <laughs> because I've had some uh, crazy times. And anytime you're pursuing a, a dream, mm -hmm. and it, I guess it's true with any job in life, but I never thought of it as a job. I just thought of it as a calling. But anytime mm -hmm. you do something that you love, you know, there's going to be things that take you here and there, maybe mm -hmm. things that, that let you down. But, you know, when you're, when you're, acting from your love of something and it's coming from your heart, you know, that's, that's what's going to keep you on the right track. So, but that's what he was saying. And really that was some amazing advice. The other advice, since you mentioned in case someone's listening that might want to mm -hmm. know how to sustain a career. The other thing he said, cause I really do feel like my songwriting, if without that, you know, I might, I don't know what I would be doing, but mm -hmm. I still maintained you know, my love for music and my love for writing songs. But he said, write, write a lot. He said, mm -hmm. well, you know, he goes, you might write nine really good songs, but that 10th song, that might be a great song. So, you know, and when he said that, it just kind of lit a fire in me. And mm -hmm. I don't know if I told you this back when you were in Nashville, but shortly after he told me, oh, I told him, I said, okay, I'm gonna write a couple of songs. I'll bring them to you and see what you think. So I um, I took him a couple of songs that I sang a cappella, and they were just fun little word games that I had fun with. And he goes, I think you got away with words. I go, you do? And he said, yeah. And I said, okay. So shortly after that, my parents were up in uh, Hot Springs, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. They were uh, building a house up there. And I walked in and my mother was in the kitchen and she said, well, Deb, sugar, what are you up to these days? And I go, oh, I'm a songwriter. <laughs> I mean, it was because he showed that confidence and faith in me. It just changed my life in an instant, you know, and if you get, and it was the greatest gift that any friend has ever given me was the opportunity to see something beyond what I'd really envisioned at that mm -hmm. time. And then you come into songs like, and we talked about this so much. I mean, Baby I Lied is played on so many different, uh, you know, big time stations out there when it comes to syndicated radio, still a song that people will never forget. It lives on uh, just an infamy for, for so many years back in 83, 82, those, those very, very big years when you had Barbara Mandrell yourself. And of course, Reba McIntyre and so many great ladies do their thing in the eighties. What made that song just so special? And it just, it was amazing to see how many fans of all different genres of music cross over and just gravitate to that tune. Right. 
Yeah, I think it was a, a partly a, sort of a sign of the times, you know, where uh, to me, I, just now, especially since I've lived a little bit longer, I've seen country music expand and then come back into traditional and expand. I think it was kind of on an expanding moment at that time. And um, I was on RCA. Actually, I recorded it for Capitol, but RCA mm -hmm. bought it later. But um, but Joe Galante had the most incredible vision for um, marketing. And uh, he, he loved that song. And he said, we're not going to wait to do a complete album. We're going to do a mini LP. We got to get this thing out there. And so it, it's they promoted it to pop radio, adult contemporary and country. And really and truly, uh, it was technically a pop record that crossed backwards into the country charts, which I was so glad it did because, you know, I was living in Nashville and I had so many friends here that I love and respected. But I just think that that was part of the appeal. Oh, and also, you know, I had been pitched a lot of songs as an artist, you know, still trying to get that one mm -hmm. song that might break things open for me. And to be honest with you, and now I understand this better now too, you know, as a songwriter, you want to pitch your songs to the people that you're sure are going to have a, a wide audience. Well, I didn't really have that going for me. At that time, I had done the Jim Reeves duets. Do you remember mm -hmm. those? I do. Yeah. yeah, I do. That was Joe Galante's idea too. He billed me as the mystery girl because no one knew who I was at that time. So I had the pleasure and honor of working with Jim Reeves. Um, and we were the very first ones to introduce the new technology of the overdubbing, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. It was after that that Natalie Cole and her dad did theirs. And of course, overdubbing's no big deal anymore. But at that mm -hmm. time, it was a big deal. So, um, I just feel like Joe's marketing on it and the way he approached it was amazing. He he fell in love with it and the promotion team fell in love with it. In fact, the promotion team at RCA, they called it the record that wouldn't go away. <laughs> and so I was like, well, that's okay with me. But what I was, I know what I was going to tell you. Um, I was not really getting pitched the a songs, you know, mm -hmm. they were going to the hotter artist at that time. So boy, I was, working, 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 writing, writing, writing. And um, so I was writing a lot with Ray Van Hoy at the time. Mm -hmm. And we had written some songs that I still love to this day and some have been out. But I said, just got to have that great song. So we called our friend Rory Burke, who Rory's written mm -hmm. a lot of hits. He wrote for Chapel Publishing. And he came over, It just to tell you how the song came about, we were all kind of huddled around in our living room. And since Rafe and I actually at that time wrote a lot together, we could practically, you know, read each other's minds. And Rory was, even though he had had so many great hits, he was still, you know, kind of getting the feel of how it felt for all three of us to be mm -hmm. together. Because I'm going to throw out an idea. Now, you might not like it, but you know, and if you if you don't, that's okay. But and then he told us this idea, and I remember we both look up over at him and go, mm hmm, and then look back over at each other, and all of a sudden I hear this little voice out of the side of my ear going, "Wait a minute, did I say I wouldn't be hurt? I lied." And I go, oh, "Rory, that is it. Did I say <laughs> I wouldn't be hurt if our love just didn't work? Maybe I lied." And then all of a sudden it just everything fell into mm -hmm. place. So at that time, actually, uh, they had put me together with Charlie Colello, who mm -hmm. had arranged a lot of the Juice Newton songs, and he was going to produce my project. So I had to fly out to L.A., and when I did, um, he fell in love with that song, but it didn't have a bridge at that time. Mm -hmm. He said, yeah. I love this, but it needs a bridge, and it needs to modulate. <laughs> we like, okay. Well, so we go back home, and I'm like standing there, and I'm like, I want to do something that's really dynamic, like, and now that I can see you walking out of my, you know, the big bridge, mm -hmm. baby, baby. I don't want to blast you out right now, but, um, you know, so, and then Rafe was playing these chords and I was singing this melody and had that big peak in it. And he says, oh, we're just going to modulate a whole step. That way they'll just feel it. They won't, no one will hear it because here's kind of a little inside joke about Nashville in the studio, when you have a song that has a modulation in it, mm -hmm. 
these musicians, they've heard everything and they've heard <laughs> modulations a million zillion times. So if you have a song that has a modulation simultaneously, they will all stand up, and go. <laughs> <laughs> so we were like, yeah, they'll, we'll just let them feel it and not hear it. So we go proudly back out to LA and play this song for Charlie Colella, who is iconic. He's, mm -hmm. he's some of the biggest artists in the world. And, um, so we play, he goes, yeah, yeah, I like it. He goes, but I didn't hear the modulation. We go, we well, know, isn't that cool? You just feel it. He goes, I don't want to feel it. I want to hear it. And so he suggested the half a step modulation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was, a, that was a stroke of genius, really, from Charlie. That was his arranging genius stepping mm -hmm. in, you know. And um, I just am so thankful for that song. So a lot of different little ingredients went into that. Mm -hmm. It began with this desire and this uh, determination and then just, you know, keeping on and keeping on being with Rory that day and just accidentally mm -hmm. the way that all came together. And then Charlie's suggestion about a modulation, you know, you just keep on till you get it right. And then even, yep. even then you don't know if it's right until the public <laughs> hears it. And when the public <laughs> hears it, if they respond the way they did, then you go, finally. Yeah, those little secrets. So you said practice does make perfect, no doubt about it. And that's what's uh, in the recommendations coming from different different heads out there. And like I said, two heads are better than one, two. And y'all did this, speaking of that, with great songwriting. Um, I know, and she's a great, great, great uh, artist for this program and has come on many times. Miss Janie Fricky, talk about the relationship with Miss Janie Fricky, because even back then in the 80s and early 90s, you had a great song uh, written with Janie, Don't Worry About Me, Baby. Remind the audience a little bit about your relationship with, with Janie and of course how she got to uh, record that great song that you wrote. Yeah. I always loved Janie Fricky because I'm from Memphis and Janie actually did some jingle singing down in Memphis before she moved to Nashville. And she's just always been an excellent singer and, you know, beautiful, rich voice and, and sang great. And, um, but I, on that song, the way it came about was I was hanging out in the studio one day and it was like mm -hmm. a lot of songwriters. We were all waiting for our turn to demo our song. And I was hanging out with Kieran Kane of the O'Kanes, although he, the O'Kanes didn't exist at that time, but just so everyone knows who Kieran is. And then Bruce Chanel, who Bruce Chanel, you know, had the big, mm -hmm. wrote and had the big hit, hey, hey, baby, I want to know if you be my girl. So we mm -hmm. were all hanging out and I'm telling you, it's kind of a hurry up and wait business, sort of like at the world of film. And so I was like, well, hey, we're here. Why don't we write a song? So I go over to the piano and start playing this intro. And we wrote about half of the song and then they called us in and said, okay, get in here. So we go in there. But um, that was actually my very first, you know, we finished the song up later that week at my house. But um, that was the very first song that I ever had as a number one song as a songwriter. And actually, I thought it was going to be a song that I released. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah. the person at my label who was, you know, heading it up just said, I don't know why he thought this, but he said, when I turned it in, he said, eh, it's not really cool for artists to sing their own songs these days. And I went, what? No. Nah. So I went, well. <laughs> Shoot, man, who were I? What, what, what train have I been driving on? <laughs> but anyway, so I, I went down to Don Gant's office. Don Gant was the um, owner of a, and he used to be the head of Sony, actually Tree Publishing, but then he opened his own company called Old Friends. That's where Bruce wrote. Mm -hmm. and I, I think Kieran might have written there too. I'm not sure, but I went down there and I said, "Man, I'm bummed out." They go, "Why?" I said, because uh, the label says that it's not cool for people to record their own songs these days. And God, <laughs> let me hear that song. And he put, turns it around, puts in the cassette. That's how long ago it was. Puts in the cassette and he's sitting there listening to it. He turns that office chair around. And he goes, that's a damn hit. <laughs> he goes, the tiny brick he's cutting today. He goes, so we all piled into his, uh, piled into his Cadillac. It was white with red interior. The reason I remember is because one day he said, how do you like my new car, Deb? And I go, well, I love everything except that red interior. He goes, oh, no, I just bought it. But anyway, so anyway, that's our little joke. But we all piled into this car. We went down to um, 
audio media, which we call audio rodeo, mm-hmm. walked in. Jim Med Norman was in the control yeah. room. Janie Fricky was out in the uh, performing room. And Don walked in with that cassette. You just had to know him. He was quite a character. <laughs> he walked in with this thing. and go, listen to this. This is it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and so he goes, well, let's just see if it is. So he, Jim Ed puts it in and pushes play, and it's on those big, beautiful, huge speakers in the control room. Mm-hmm. And he goes, this is a hit. Janie, get in here. So she came in, and they cut it that day. I mean, that doesn't really happen that much these days. No, it does not. You're exactly right, too. And it's, uh, again, those songs that live on uh, for the rest of our lives. Uh, the classic country we talk about from the era that uh, you grew up in. Well, I'll tell you what, so much more to get to with uh, the great Deborah Allen here. It is the backstage pass. we got to take a time out. We could talk forever because her and I, we don't not have that problem. We love to talk. I'm going to bring on my good buddy, CJ Garten. He's one of our newest co-hosts here. On okay. the backstage pass, he'll be with us during CRS 2023. He's also a musician there, Nashville recording artist. We'll have more with Deborah Allen. He'll join us here. Uh, CJ Garten coming back. He's got a few questions for Deborah. Uh, right now, a word from our sponsors. Stay tuned. A lot more coming up with the great Deborah Allen here. It is the backstage pass. Hang tight. The bangtail pour is comprised of a sweet corn mash you're so, base. You're so the front fun. has a subtle sweetness and not too sharp. It has notes of a medium char or white oak for a smoky flavor in the middle. And the tail has a super smooth and warm finish. Go behind the scenes with some of the biggest artists in music today with the Backstage Pass, powered by the SportsGuysPodcast.com. Join Brandon Morrill and his co-host Kirsty Krause as they talk to rising right stars and legends here. about their music careers. Listen to their latest tracks and learn fun facts about the men and women behind the music you love. And be sure to tune in to the Backstage Pass Monday through Friday from 3.30 to 6.30, powered by the SportsGuysPodcast.com. And welcome in to the Backstage Pass... And back here on the show again is CJ Garten making his debut here on the Backstage Pass, one of my newest co-hosts here for the show. Again, presented by Bangtail Whiskey, our friends over at MitchMax.com. And, of course, Hank Jr. Productions. We're live on the YouTube channel. And, of course, at the SportsGuysPodcast.com. Uh, or thanks to the great Casey Stern for coming on, talking some Major League Baseball earlier today. If you missed that one, you can catch it out there on the uh, platforms we uh, broadcast on. Back here with the great Deborah Allen here on the show talking about the legendary songs, the ones she wrote, and, of course, the newest album, The Art of Dreaming, out there. CJ, good to have you, brother. Man, I'm glad to be here. I appreciate you guys. Uh, I apologize if there's any background noise. I'm in my big old off-road Jeep, and I'm right down the street from the house. We got out of the studio a little late today. And I told him, I said, I got to be somewhere. Y'all got to let me go. <laughs> but you know how that is. They get to, they get to working and talking and going at it. Next thing you know, uh, you're in there twice as long as you planned. <laughs> no doubt. Hey, Deborah, tell me about this. I think it's a beautiful album. What a great time to put this out to with everybody sort of coming out of the pandemic now. Uh, we talked a little bit about this at the Omni at CRS when we were there. Uh, Run Baby Run was a great song to lead off a great album in the art of dreaming. Just tell people how exciting it was to put out a new, fresh, just Deborah Allen sound with some great songs on a great album. Thank you so much for saying that, Brandon. And hey, CJ, it's so good to meet you. Um, so glad you're here with us today. No, listen, it, you know, I have been putting a few things out on my own, some EPs, you know, independently. And I got a call from my good friend, Chuck Rhodes. And Chuck was a promotion person that I had worked with and great friend on Giant Records when I had Rock Me and all that stuff mm-hmm. out in the uh, mid 90s. And he said, oh, you, Hey, you Tim Johnson then. Huh? You knew Tim Johnson then. Yeah. Oh, yes, I sure did. Yeah. Tim. Tim, Tim was a sweetheart. When I moved here out of the Navy in 2005, 2004, I got to meet him and spend time with them and uh, do some writing. I actually cut one of his songs on this uh, on this record, um, Lonely at the Top, that uh, Keith Whitley originally did. And they were, wow. there were some really great folks over there. I always remember that big old rocking chair. Yeah, yeah, and I love Tim. We got together one time and... Um, and wrote about half a song, but then we never did finish it up. And I regret that to this day because he's such a great songwriter. Maybe, maybe me and you'll have to get together and go shred it with him. Hey, that's a good <laughs> idea. Let's try to do that. And I can't wait to hear your, your new album too. 
Oh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it very much. I always, I always try to turn people on and set off. <laughs> yeah, that's a good, that's a good plan. <laughs> but y'all also had a good one too, Deborah, on that album I love so much, which was a uh, blue collar baby was on this, this new one that you guys have about kind of tell people the, the arrangement of that one and the inspiration behind it. Yeah. I wrote that song with my good buddy, Al Anderson. He, uh, he is an incredible songwriter and actually uh, the Rolling Stones, I don't remember which uh, year it was, but Rolling Stone magazine dubbed him uh, one of the, in the top 100 greatest songwriter, I mean, greatest guitar players of mm -hmm. all time. And uh, he was in RBQ. He was the lead uh, guitar player for them. And it's a great group. Then eventually he moved to Nashville and that's when he and I got together and started writing some songs. And, uh, I just love Blue Collar Baby, you know. It, I love it because really of the times these days. To me, sometimes I think blue collar workers sort of uh, get misunderstood, you know what I mean? And and don't really get a fair shake, you know, from the truckers to the welders to the coal miners to you name it, you know. Uh, it's They always seem to be the first one to not get the fair shake. And so to have a, a little rockabilly tune with uh, Al Anderson come out called Blue Collar Baby, it just kind of made my heart <laughs> happy. Yeah. Well, I, I tell you what, compliments to your, your cover. You look very gorgeous on there and it's, it's very flattering for you. It's y'all are phenomenal. If I sing a lot, I'd date you. Thank you. <laughs> you know, I have a really talented friend. Her name is Cindy Hornsby and she took that picture and she and I've been friends for a long time. She does. She's actually, she just did some great photos out at the Grand Ole Opry of, Barbara Mandrell and Jeannie Seeley and Linda Davis and everybody, Carrie Underwood. She's, she's just got a talent for it, you know? Yeah. So I, I really love her work. Thank you. You're, you're very welcome. Absolutely. Darling. <laughs> well, I tell you, I got to get into a little rapid fire because I know Deborah always kind enough to join us here on the program. And of course I know she'll be at CRS 2023. Always. This album is fantastic. If you guys have not, uh, checked it out. It's the art of dreaming across all the digital platforms. Go get your uh, copy now or make sure you stream that here uh, on the uh, backstage pass. Let's jump into a little rapid fire because Deborah, I love doing this with you. Um, and it's always good, good to get to know you more on the personal side. If anything has changed since we last talked, um, any good food or any good drinks you're getting into right now? Mm, good food or good drinks. Well, I almost got into that Italian food. If I could cook, I'd be <laughs> down, deep yeah. down in it. Let's see. Well, <laughs> Well, I love, I mean, I kind of eat a lot of vegetables, but I love fried cabbage and onions and stuff like that. I kind of like soul food like that. And then my husband is an incredible cook. He's got one of those great big smokers and he smokes mm -hmm. some, uh, pork chops and stuff like that. And he's got a skirt steak, you know, naturally he'd go for the skirt steak. <laughs> <laughs> Tastes good stuff. I've been riding that whole way myself. I got a chimichurri sauce. I get out there and go to the wood, a little apple wood with it. Mm. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I just like to, I like to, I don't know about apple wood. I don't know what it is he puts in it. Some sort of a smoker pellet thing that he does. Like that. And, and, and I went over, I went over to CJ's house, Deborah too, and I got to try some of that cooking so I can vouch for for CJ during CRS, we got to meet up and hang out a little bit. So his cooking is on point. I just wanted to let you know. That's cool. So CJ, <laughs> is this going to be your album or is it a band album? What is it? It's my album. I got a double vinyl called Tales of the Old West. Um, I'm trying to be the guy who I grew up, I'm a sixth generation cattle rancher by birth. I've been a mm -hmm. writer for years in town, but mm -hmm. I want to give everybody the feeling of country music the way we knew country growing mm -hmm. up. And right. I want to young guy is the inspiration and i want to work with every single person i think it takes a village for something like that to happen yeah and i've learned a lot from people such as yourself uh leona williams um joe spivey's my right hand man and my yeah. partner my label mm -hmm. and so we're, we're we're just putting songs that say something again out there it has a really cool nostalgia of, of the, that wild west feel that oklahoma texas root feel I love that. You know, I, I definitely love that. And it's making me want to just come on out and say, hey, we got to get together sometime for sure. I, I would love that. I'd be honored, actually. Um, you I know, would be honored, too. Thank you so much. Yeah, it seems like a lot of stuff that I've been getting cut are by people who are legendary artists like Tanya Tucker, David Onco. People like that really seem to enjoy writing with us. I know Hawk over there. And uh, mm -hmm. 
you know, Denny Knight, we've been doing some work with them, Billy Don Burns. Uh, uh, it's just all these people I meet. I just, it seems to be kind of the old soul vein. And that yeah. I, really, I really like that. Well, that's what I was telling um, Brandon a minute, a minute ago. <clears throat> you know, sometimes, and I've been, you know, in Nashville for a while, but it's like I've, I've observed through the years that it'll, it's, it'll kind of expand and then it'll come back to traditional, to, to its roots, you know. And, and I like that because, you know, you can uh, make the fanciest demo in the world. You can have all the bells and whistles on it you want it to have. But, you know, if you don't have something to say and say it in a way that, that people can really, you know, it's not going to go over at a songwriter night. <laughs> well, no, it's not. And people can see through that stuff. And yeah. so the first person you got to be honest with is yourself. Yes, you do. And you do. when you find that and you're comfortable in that, and that's sat, you're saturated in that that's that has it's the same way as whenever a pebble hits water it's going to have a ripple effect and and when people right. feel that emotion i mean honestly that's why i came into music because music saved my life as a little kid growing up it was interpretation of how i understood the world around me mm -hmm. and it me um it was it was a very healing aspect to me when i was feeling certain ways i could turn on the radio and listen to a song that allowed me to get through that and so whenever i wrote and started writing and, and i translated that the same way and you know the biggest gifts and the biggest blessings has always been when someone comes up to you and shares that they received that the way you was hoping yeah. i have some songs like that you know after a show that you know when you're hanging out with people that that came to see you at the show all of a sudden you're standing there with a complete stranger and they're opening their whole heart to you and telling you <laughs> about it and that's when you go i'm so thankful that that song came to be absolutely i mean i think a lot of times the songs are bigger than us and we don't even realize it until it gets out there and gets the opportunity i'm sure you've experienced that time and time again but that's one thing that never gets old um you know i've, I've had people come up and i've written songs that i played that you know I, I love the song i wrote it for my wife or something or something like that and they said hey you know that that song saved our marriage you know that yeah. song you know when we got in Right. It, it, it made me think of something funny. I have a cousin, and I had this song called Break These Chains. And uh, she, her name's Sheila, and she called up and said, Deb, I love that new song. Love that new video. It's so good. And you know what? It gave me the courage to go on and get that divorce. I went, oh, my gosh. Well, okay, I'm, I'm glad. Well, it kind of had the reverse but, effect, but maybe uh, she needed to get out of it. Well, hey, hey the marriage, and you're, you're – I, made a divorce so that's a good thing but cause, exactly because honestly well, she wound up she wound up getting married again to a really wonderful person well and that's what you want because sometimes you know you just grow apart it's like it, it's funny as i'll get out you know that old george Strait movie uh with grandma ivy you know and she always talked about how the trees that you know when that tree grows up they can they can become one and grow together or, or the other one's going to die off and the other one's going to take yeah. over yeah, that reminds me of another story too not about a song but i had this neighbor that used to live next door to me and uh, they were older people and he loved to play golf and they used to go play golf all the time together but then she couldn't go anymore she just pretty much stayed in her recliner but anyway she died and they had planted these two oak trees in the front yard maybe this is something a story in here somewhere but they planted these two uh, oak trees in the front yard. And when she died shortly after her tree died. Oh, wow. And then, and then shortly he lived there for a good while. And then shortly after he passed away, I'm not making this up at all. His tree died. Wow. That's There's a story a, in there. Yeah. You, yeah. Right. You can't tell me that story and then not plan on getting together on that one because that's that's definitely a song if i ever heard one yeah there's got to be something in there and i've had that story forever i've told it a few times but i'd never realized really it could be such a good story for a song possibly it was it, i mean that and that's what it is i mean a, a great song is a story with a, a beautiful melody so i mean it sounds like it's already you know i actually already written itself we just gotta we just gotta kind of not mess it up and yeah, we better we better not talk about it too much. We'll have to uh, split it 55 million ways. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I know, too, Deborah, you love writing. And I know we came on and talked about this before. Um, how's the book doing? I know it was the uh, Loneliest Christmas Tree. Tell people about this. I know a great project in itself. And 
And, and I got to read it cover to cover. I loved it. Thank you. Well, that was just strictly a gift from God. You know, I mean, I did not plan on writing a book. Uh, I just planned on going to buy a calligraphy pen and an art pad. And when I did, I got home and I go, well, let me check this out and see what the what this looks like. I knew I wasn't really a person that knew how to use the pen. So I picked it up and I just wrote once upon a time. And I went, hmm, I guess I could write a book. And I never got up all day long. I sat there till four o'clock until I couldn't think of what happened next. <laughs> so the next morning I got up, was drinking some coffee. And then I go, oh, I know what happens next. And I had so much fun for four days. It was finished in four days. And it was just really a gift from God. I had so much fun writing it. And it's called The Loneliest Christmas Tree. And my uh, good friend, Kix Brooks, his daughter, Molly Brooks, finally years later, I, I, I'd kind of taken it to get it published a couple of times. And I had it written out in a special way. And uh, But they want you to type it in a straight way. So I tried that. And then I had this one publisher that said, Oh, we love your book, but we don't really like the the hero in the book. I go, well, since it was a gift from God, I guess I'm going to keep the hero like it was. So it just sort of laid there forever until one day I was writing with Kicks and we wrote a couple of songs and we were walking to the front door and I was asking him about his kids. He goes, have you ever seen Molly's artwork? And I go, no. So I go to her website and I look it up and a little light bulb goes off and I go, well, maybe because some some publishers would say you need to have an illustrator. So mm -hmm. I, I read it to her and you know, what's really, to me, there's a couple of little magic points about this book to me. And that is that I read it to her. And at the end of it, she goes, when did you write this book, Deborah? And I said, Oh, Molly, I'm embarrassed to tell you. She goes, well, when? I said, 1986. She goes, oh, that's the year I was born. I go, you're kidding me. She said, no. And guess what day I was born on? I said, what? She goes, Christmas Eve. And that's a big turning point in the book. Mm -hmm. So I said, oh, gosh, I would love it if you would do it. So she did. But also the other turning point is the hero in the book without trying to give it away too much. But she was a lady um, that I befriended, you know, and she had a kind of rough living out in the elements and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, she became the hero. And I didn't even know that she was going to be it until I started going, Hey, what's her name? And her name was Carol. So, well, mm -hmm. I can't tell you the rest of it. Y'all got to get the book. Yeah, you read the book. But <laughs> I love it every, every year. I'm telling you, it's sort of like a really good Christmas song. If you got mm -hmm. a really good Christmas book, especially since, you know, honestly, I feel like it, I had a, my hand was holding the pen, but I really feel like someone else was in charge and in control. But, um, Every year, you know, it makes me so happy because adults and kids like this book. And I feel like it has a message that's a, a, a good, positive message, too. It's awesome. Is the book out and available? I'd love to check it out because I have not got the opportunity to read it. Yeah, it's at DeborahAllen.com for anybody that wants it. And, you know, I love to send people to my website because on my on my albums, my pictures and my book, um, I always love to, you know, autograph them, personalize them for everybody. But yeah, and believe it or not, oh yeah, actually I do have a version of it. I've never put this out there and I need to, but I've got a version of me reading the book mm -hmm. and it's got a few little sound things in it too. But I don't know, maybe I'll do that this year, but believe it or not, I love to read the book. If I know it takes me 17 minutes to read it. <laughs> <laughs> I tell people it takes me six minutes to boil eggs, so I think I can read. <laughs> <laughs> well, next time I'm gonna bring my copy of it to Nashville, and I tell you what, we'll get CJ a copy. He'll be down there with me at CRS 2023 at the Omni. You can yeah. autograph our copies if you don't mind, and just come I hang out. I would love to. I would love to, <laughs> and I, I absolutely would love to. Well, I tell you what, the uh, my my wife's favorite holiday is Christmas. Um, Still, yeah, she still got Santa Claus on her on her writing list every year, and yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, we actually are dropping a, a Christmas album. We're working on it this month. I leave in a couple of weeks. You're working on a Christmas album? Yeah, and uh, we're only we're not going to drop all ten, but we're going to drop about three or four songs. And yeah. I'm paying homage, that have always inspired me. Mm -hmm. uh, you no, know, um, and some other stuff like that. White Christmas, something that's got that really low, nice vocal that's just 
just reminds you of the holidays when you hear it. And then I got some stuff that I wrote. I got one I wrote called Chinese Checkers and Electric Trains. Oh, I love that. And that. Oh. <laughs> It's cool because this kid is like really going through the process of wanting this and wanting this and wanting this and then not getting it. Mm -hmm. And like, you know how we play the mean mom and dad joke where, oh, wait a minute, there's one extra present over here in the corner. Oh, and yeah, he, yeah. He does get it. <laughs> I got the Christmas story. And uh, you know how you watch it? You know, you shoot your eye out. You shoot your eye out and you want a BB gun. Every kid wants a BB gun. Well, I was cleaning the attic and my kids got Chinese checkers and electric trains for Christmas and I cleaned the attic out and those two items were the two items that were still in boxes. They unwrapped it and they never even opened the box. <laughs> and so I sit down in July of last year and wrote this song looking at the two unopened boxes about this kid who got Chinese checkers and electric trains and all he wanted was a daisy. BB gun. Wow, I love that. But I just I love the Christmas spirit. I love the Christmas holidays. Uh, mm -hmm. It's the time of giving, but it's a time you know where we remember what what it's all for, uh, family and God, that kind of thing. So I, I love your book. I love your story about your book and that kind of thing. The Loneliest Christmas Tree. Um, I can't wait to read it. So and hopefully, I can't wait for you to read it. I hope you like it. I'm gonna <laughs> love. Be. Of all 17 minutes of it. Now I might read slower, so I might be 19 minutes. Okay. <laughs> well, 17 or 19, 19 minutes. 19 minutes, and I'll feel like I'm <laughs> it's It's a, a fantastic read. Make sure you go check it out. Uh, DebraAllen.com, and of course, uh, The Loneliest Christmas Tree. Uh, we'll be bringing our copies there, and, and it's here at CRS 2023 in Nashville, Tennessee, March 13th to 15th. And of course, uh, The Art of Dreaming is out there across all the digital platforms, wherever you guys stream or get your music. Make sure you go check it out. Uh, Deborah, always a fantastic uh, just journey. We get to catch up with you here on the show. Always great having you, an icon in the business. Uh, best of luck going forward. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much. I appreciate you so much. Hey, should we give a should we give a CD away? You know, I'm I'm okay with that, CJ. Let's do that. Let's do it. I just wow. happened to have one right here. Mm. You can read a good time. I dare you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I tell you what, what. How do we give this away, CJ? I tell you what. As one of the newest co-hosts is here on the backstage pass, let's think of a great way we can give away this great Deborah Allen CD. I'll mail it to him. I'll sign it and everything. Okay. Let's see how we can do so, this. Yeah, we're getting ready, actually getting ready to do the brand new video uh, mm. probably this weekend. And so I'm okay. super excited about it. The song that we're going to do on this video is called All or Nothing at All. So, I'm excited about that. I have a quick question. Okay. Uh, was, was your first number one a song that you actually was a singer on? Or is it your first number one a song that you had cut? My first number one song was my Janie Freaky song that I, we were talking about that a minute mm -hmm. ago, a song that I wrote with my buddy, uh, Kieran Kang, who wound up being in the O'Kanes, and my buddy, uh, Bruce Chanel, who wrote the song, Hey, Hey, Baby. We were in the studio, we wrote that, and I really thought I was going to record it, and I was going to have it out, but my label at the time, we talked about this, said they didn't think it was cool for artists these days to record their own songs i'm like you're kidding me yeah so you know it was meant to be because janie freaky recorded it and it was a big old number one on her and it's got it's a millionaire play so you know i can't complain at all and i still get to sing it so so how about this if anybody else can name another one of your number ones Ooh, right. how about they earn that cd you got there for i the like year. that Oh, that's a okay, good contest. So let's do that contest. You leave your comments in the uh, comment box there. And, of course, we'll go back. And uh, Deborah, of course, is in the interview. We'll be uh, sharing it across her socials uh, later on tonight or tomorrow. And if we pick a winner, you guys can uh, can DM or, or get in touch with Deborah that way. She'll sign it and send it to your uh, your address. We put some information in there or Facebook Messenger. So that's yeah, a good way. Absolutely. Just let me know who to send it to, and I will. I sure will. And of course, I know how to get in touch with you because we can chat. So I can touch you that way too. So as well. when, are, when are you coming back to town, Brandon? I will be there probably in March uh, 2023. CJ and I are going to be uh, doing the um, CRS 2023 event March 13th to 15th. And uh, yeah. we'll be there at the Omni Hotel interviewing just great artists like yourself. So we'll be there. That was so much fun. I mean, it was like, it's, it's like so many people were just so glad to be back out this year. Oh, absolutely. I, and I, I love the fact they put it in. Uh, in March, CJ, maybe it'll be a little warmer, and there won't be as much rain as we had this past uh, February. Hey, 
I'm sorry, but I'm sitting here in Nashville, and I'll take all the cold you want to give me. <laughs> it care. has been hot. I it's hot and muggy today. Very hot and muggy today. Yeah. Hey, hey, I don't mean to just distract at all, but but one thing I did want to share with you, and we don't have time to talk about it right now, but maybe next time when we get together, aside from my record, which I still am excited about, and I know we're going to be you know, doing things with different songs on there, but I'm excited because we just got back from Israel. Ooh. Oh, that's that, that was a wonderful trip, CJ, Brandon. Y'all got to go sometime. It was very, very moving. And, you know, like I know you're getting ready to wrap it up, but next time we get together, maybe we can talk about that. We'll start that at the top. Next time we do that, we'll talk about Israel and a whole lot more. And, of course, uh, check her out. Again, DebraAllen.com. Go get The Loneliest Christmas Tree. And, of course, uh, get the album The Art of Dreaming across all the digital platforms. We'll see you guys next week. No show Monday. Uh, Tuesday through Thursday, some great artists coming on. Holly Tucker, Texas Country Music. Uh, Megan Patrick, I know we're going to get in touch with Billy Dean, Marty Raven of Shenandoah, and a whole lot more that uh, CJ and I are working on. It is the Backstage Pass live on the YouTube channel. And, of course, uh, check out if you missed the interview today with Casey Stern. Uh, his podcast is unfiltered. It's on the Believe Sports Network out there. Uh, check him out. One of the best baseball and sports minds in the business. You can check it out on the Believe Sports Network and at the sportsguyspodcast.com. CJ, good to have you, brother. We're going to take this ride into the fall, and uh, appreciate you joining the other uh, show. My pleasure. Love you guys so much. I appreciate y'all going ahead and carrying on until I get caught up, and I, <laughs> I'll be on top of the hour. And uh, talking to Israel with you. And Deborah Allen, <laughs> good luck with the record, and I cannot wait to actually uh, – <laughs> catch up with you in person and maybe uh, tackle one of those songs. Yeah, I'm sure we don't live far from each other. I'm sure we can make that happen. I would love to. Absolutely, yeah. darling. Trent means a good time anytime you want to. <laughs> yeah, all right. Got it. We'll, talk, we'll <laughs> talk to you guys next week. It is the Backstage Pass again to the YouTube channel. And, of course, uh, check them out, DebraAllen.com and the Art of Dreaming across all the digital platforms. Until next week, have a great weekend. I know I will. And keep the rain coming because, man, we've had a drought here in Texas. Uh, keep it cool at about 75 to 80 degrees and less less heat. Right, Deborah? You're getting some rain up there, right? Yeah, we are. <laughs> and I just remembered I'm going to be in Stephenville, Texas in October Ooh. at a songwriting so yeah, right, Keith Sykes on. and Sean Camp and uh, Steve Earle and me and a bunch of people. Chuck Cannon. I'm going to be uh, down there in tour because I've got a single Good Gone coming out. And so mm -hmm. during October, I'm, I'm I'm not at that event. But if I can sneak around there where you're at, I'd love to come yeah. check you out. Come on. Uh, I, it'll be it'll be different than one of my regular shows with my band because I'll just be accompanying myself. But it's going to be fun, a fun songwriter thing, you know, with some fun friends. So I'm not even sure of the date. But it's in October, and I'm sure it'll be on my uh, Facebook site and Instagram sure. and all. You guys I'll make sure you check it out. How many then, times have you tried to end this conversation? Brandon? It's all good. I'm good. Like I said, we just keep it coming. <laughs> CJ and I can talk. That's why we're in this business. No doubt about it. I, we'll see. I, we'll see you guys. I, my grandma always said, "Southerners don't know how to say goodbye. Northerners don't know how to." Say that's right. <laughs> well, we yes. got to say goodbye here on the show uh, for everybody that makes it possible. We'll All see right. you guys uh, next week on the Backstage Pass. Until then, have a great weekend. We'll see you soon. Take care. I love y'all. Thank you.